One of the massive areas that I think the unschooling movement is growing in is in the development of group spaces and unschooling communities and um, even just loose gatherings of families who are de-schooling together. It feels to me like this is the era of collective unschooling. It's a super exciting time. And with me for today's video, I have Sari and Becca, who have so much wisdom on this very subject. So let me welcome them in. So welcome to Becca and Sari, who are dialing in from Mexico. I've only really just got to know you over the last half a year or so, and I've been loving your work with Radical Learning on Instagram. And also, especially, uh, it feels like an especially big privilege to have you here because you are running basically like a little unschooling school where you are. And I am fascinated by this, and I know that uh, people watching this video will be really interested in that too. Why don't you just tell me and my viewers a little bit about you and the work that you're doing with your group in Mexico to begin with? You want to jump first? Okay, <laughs> I'll jump first. I'll try to be brief. So uh, I'm from Sweden and I'm trained as a teacher. I grew up in the Montessori system. So when I started um, junior high, secondary school, I was just like, what? is this this is bad and that's why I decided to train as a teacher and I thought that I could bring something to the system and maybe change it but that's not possible um, it wasn't then and I don't think it is now really so moving forward I didn't work for a long time as a teacher because I burnt out trying to change the system moved to Mexico in 2003 and my son was born in 2005 and I realized immediately that I was not going to put him in an ordinary school. So I co-founded um, a Waldorf initiative up in the city of Oaxaca, here in the southern parts of Mexico. And then I moved and founded another Waldorf initiative here where we're living and ran into the Waldorf teaching philosophy. Like, oh my God, like very hierarchical, very... Um, adultistic my son hated it and my son is also on the autism spectrum and even though his group was tiny tiny he never got really the um, the support that he needed from his teachers and also I think that it was just there were so many challenges so when he had just turned 10 we decided to leave that project and I decided that I wanted to go into unschooling with him because I knew that that was going to work for him and at the same time I was like but what am I'm, I what am I going to do then so I decided to found Explora which is an agile learning center it was an agile learning center now it's turned into more like an agile learning community and that was in 2016 and then I was really 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 tired of it all again because it's very hard to run Something like that, I think in general, it's very challenging to, to run a micro unschooling school. I think that we're very much ahead of our time and it's hard finding people who understand self-directed education and unschooling and that are willing. So when I started it, it was like kindergarten and after school because I knew that there was no market for like something um, full time for kids seven and up. And then, um, yeah, in 2020, you came down just before the pandemic hit. We really connected. Sari said. There's like crazy planes, helicopter. <laughs> I can't hear it. Your mic is doing a great job. Oh, I, I actually cool. can only hear a parrot. Really? Oh. Okay, I, I can hardly hear her. Anyway, it was so loud. Um, so 2020, you came down and we connected and you said, well, you said, <laughs> no. I, you were like, I am burnt out and tired and I just need, you know, I'm looking for somebody to like hand over the keys. And I was just like, I'll do it. That sounds like an awesome project. <laughs> 
Um, but at the time I was living in New York and I was also running an agile learning center in New York um, right before the pandemic hit and was about to, you know, collaborate with some folks on opening up a community center, um, doing all the things, you know, unschooling also with my son, who, um, who is the reason why I'm doing all of this, really. And he was the impetus to, to get involved with, with just trying to rethink everything from the beginning. But yeah, I was, I was at the time when that I met Becca, I was like really tired of living the hustle in New York and also looking for community and also wanting to be in a space that was really um, supportive of a slower lifestyle and supportive of having more spaciousness to like be creative and to mess around and play around and kind of fumble when I, when I can, you know, and not, you know, cost the rent over it kind of thing, you know? And so when um, we met, I was still directing the program digitally over there because the pandemic hit. And then when I came here, it was like, well, I'm not leaving. This is too good. Like this is life is much better, slower. Um, and then a really beautiful community was starting to form here. And so we actually like to call Explora just a learning community. We don't call it a school at all, because for us, it's really about um, unschooling families coming together and really living, living together, like not necessarily living you know, right next to each other, right one on top of the other. We don't have a communal living space, but it's really about us sharing our lives together and exploring and being learners of the world um, and sharing that experience together. And that can look like, for instance, one parent saying, wow, I wish we had a book club. Okay, now we have a book club. No. Or uh, another parent saying, there's a great kickboxing teacher here. Who wants to do kickboxing? And we're like, uh, okay. <laughs> so just wanted to explore a little bit the dynamic between Wardorf, neurodiversity and unschooling um, because I feel like the unschooling world actually has quite a lot of almost Wardorf refugees sort of like we've gone mm. from attachment parenting to what looks like a very beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, very gentle, um, kind of child-centered pedagogy. Um, and then it has felt like coming up against something that, I don't know, doesn't really suit our neurodivergent children. And um, some people just carry on that path and somehow make it work and, and then others do something different. And I'd just love to hear a little bit from you about what that transition was like, what appealed to you about Wardorf to begin with, and then you know what you think the particular things that could have worked, um, you know, and then the stuff that just really couldn't. Like what I sort of sometimes I think that Wardorf and unschooling together could actually be kind of amazing and um, because of the sort of held culture of Wardorf yeah. communities I think can can really can be very nourishing space I don't know talk to me a little bit about that yeah. so like for me it wasn't e an easy choice to go Wardorf because I grew up in Montessori which was very self-directed and and I grew up being self-directed so for me it wasn't appealing at all the idea of a teacher directing with a curriculum that was the same for everyone um, <clears throat> even though the curriculum because I had to dive deep into it and understand it and all these different different aspects of it and why a seven-year-old and an eight-year-old couldn't really be together in the same group because they're psychologically in a different develop developmental phase. All those things were really hard for me to accept because I grew up in a classroom with age-mixed kids. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't at all very, like it, what, what attracted me was obviously the aesthetics I mean, it's beautiful, but then down here in Mexico, you can't get those, like all those materials, they're so expensive. Like for an, a Mexican economy, we always had to compromise, like not maybe the best quality, but the next best. And then, you know, just, just there, it kind of, eh. and then again, I was like this focus on, on the surface, like it should be appealing to the eye but what is really happening underneath? 
And what I was seeing, like I was really doing the best I could to support um, the persons that we hired in order to actually do the work with the kids. We didn't have any Waldorf trained people, so we had to send them to trainings. And I was doing everything I could in order to support them, but it was really challenging because if you live in America or you live in Germany or Norway, wherever, going down that road as a teacher, it will be two to three years full time and maybe even five years. You can do a PhD in Waldorf pedagogy. And here in Mexico, it boils down to a total of 15 weeks spread out on five years, like three weeks per summer, which gives you 15 weeks, which is like this. And the Waldorf world is so huge and so immense that what I felt was that our teachers, they would grasp a little bit of what it was. And then they would know that there was a lot else, but they would kind of cling on to this little thing, making it very dogmatic. Yeah. And so, for instance, they, they would come back from a training and they would say, now we know what's wrong with autistic people. It's that their soul hasn't fully incarnated in the body. They're carrying their soul like in a little balloon on the outside of the body. And I would look at my son and go, this kid, there is no way his soul is in a balloon outside of his body. <laughs> wow. And so... Yeah. I'm not saying that this is what the Waldorf pedagogy says, but I'm saying that this is what these teachers brought down with them. And yeah. just hearing something like that and understanding that there was something wrong with my kid and that we couldn't fix him, it was just like very off-putting. And that combined with him not feeling seen, heard, supported, respected, he was scared. He couldn't talk like with the teacher and tell her what he really felt because she would immediately just like silence, you know, like very authoritarian. So I went out with it understanding that that was not what Waldorf was about. But I think it's very easy for Waldorf to kind of go there. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Like I, I never... Sai was never in a Waldorf setting, but we did go to visit one, like a Waldorf um, school in, in New York. And the, I remember so clearly he went and he was tiny, like, I think he was like four or three or something like that. And he went and he like picked up a doll from like one station, one area and like brought it over to another kid. And they were like, no, 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 no. That belongs over there. You know, and I was like, okay, this is not the place for us <laughs> because it was just, it was really, yeah, it was exactly, it was like, thank you, bye. Um, and not to knock it because for some people it works, right? Like one of the things in building community and unschooling communities is that you know that not every environment is for every kid. Yeah. And so I would imagine that for some, maybe that that system works. I personally yeah. still like what you were saying, Becca, I find it still very limiting um and what I experienced too in knowing some some Waldorf teachers in my personal life is that there's still this idea of what kids need to learn when they need to learn it, and that how they know to. best exactly like there's still this very like top-down approach based on somebody else's idea of what learning is yeah. and needs to be and I just want to insert here that my my son got completely school wounded by this experience he still refuses mm -hmm. to touch anything that has to do with math and I can see that like his socialization and all that stuff, it's coming along really well right now, but he was just, he just shut down. Yeah. And it's taken years for him to, to be where he's at right now. Of course it's maturity yeah. too and all that stuff, but yeah, he had like a really hardcore first de-schooling year before he was actually capable of starting to unschool. Yeah. And he was only. Thank you so much for your thoughts. It's so interesting to just touch in on that. And, you know, maybe after this video, I might be able to find somebody who is applying some of the beautiful cult like parts of Wardorf to a self-directed learning setting. If you're out there, I'd love to hear from you. Um, but I have spent a lot of time with the curriculum this year. And um, it has been a very eyebrow raising experience where I've been like, what? 
<laughs> like really yeah. quite massive claims made with very yeah. little basis whatsoever. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I have only ever seen it applied very dogmatically. Um, yeah. And that does make me very hesitant to sort of encourage, I guess, people. And, and I think it comes down to the feeling that um, kids, there's almost like a perfect child and yes. we need to try and create perfect yeah. children out of our children. Uh, I, I found that come up a lot, the sense of that. Um, and they there's a sense within Wardorf that um, more control and a yeah. more controlled environment, a more controlled um, experience for the child will help the child become that kind of ideal yeah child you know absolutely I, I will say though that I think that for kindergarten you can absolutely have like an unschooling kindergarten with Waldorf elements because I did that and it worked marvels yeah. and the kids loved it mm. and so there was like a soft structure but it was so much freer than any of the previous kindergartens that I had founded so like I think you can do it on that level, but when kids grow, mm, it's hard. Isn't it? I mean, everything around the arts too is, yeah. is, is wonderful. Like the storytelling and the dance and the theater. And, but again, if that's like mandatory or if it's like, that was the point. you know, something that, was... that needs to happen in yeah. order for a kid to be seen as successful or thriving, mm -hmm. um, then, then yeah, it, in my opinion, it doesn't, it's not really child-led. <laughs> no, and I mean, this is, this was Teo's experience. He wanted to draw more. He loved drawing. He stopped drawing after that experience, but he asked particularly for more drawing. And the teacher said, but we do draw in the morning. And it was true. She would draw, she would make the drawing and they would have to copy. And my son was like, but I want to draw freely. And she was just like, no, there's no time for that not going to happen and then again like where is the arts I think I'm doing a really good job holding my face in quite a neutral position for this conversation <laughs> noticing that I was like wow I'm trying, trying really hard to just keep a neutral expression <laughs> I <can> do this <laughs> Well, inside yeah. all sorts of things are going on. But yeah, I think you mentioned school wounds. And I think, um, you know, I, I sort of jokingly say I've got one Steiner child because she would fit in fine with that whole process. She would love all of it. You know, she'd just go along and do watercolors and put the yellow down first and not touch the other paints because that's the rule. Um, and then I have one very distinct, not anti-Steiner child. <laughs> And she she would just blow the whole thing up, you know, and um, and I do think if you get those kids in that setting, it can be incredibly um, wounding, incredibly. Um, and I think that's the thing, right, Lucy, that it, it takes time, like for us, like what unschooling is all about and in creating an unschooling learning community, or if you want to call it school, whatever you want to call it is is about relationship like it's not even about like what we're learning it's mm -hmm. about who we are and yeah. how we're showing up mm -hmm. and what we're sharing with one another and just our humanity and so there is no curriculum to that like maybe curriculum comes in when kids are like i want to do math like <laughs> there are kids in our in our community that are like i want math worksheets and it's like yeah i'll go online i'll print those out i'll order a book from amazon or <laughs> whatever yeah. it is you know okay but so it, this is this is a really a little thing. I would love to hear what jumped out to both of you independently about the Agile Learning Center model. Because both of you just went on that journey totally independently of each other. So right. tell me, what was the magic for you? Well, I would say, because I had been re researching for quite some time, I was still in that Waldorf setting and I was like, this is not working. And so I was like looking for other ways to do it. And I did, I hadn't found Agile Learning Centers. That was a friend of mine who suddenly sent me a message saying, hey, have you checked this out? I think that this is what you're looking for, because I was in this, like, I want to do something different. And so I went to the website, agilelearningcenters.org, 
And I was like, oh my God, yes. Because I wanted, first, my idea was to create like an after school for teenagers who don't have any place to go here where we live. Because it's a small place and there are many of them who get school wounded and they, they, there are no activities for them. And then when I was thinking about a Sudbury model, I was like, I'm not sure people here are ready to just dive into self-direction without any kind of frame to hold mm -hmm. them. And what I saw within the AOC network was a frame, like a way to begin the morning, like just to set the day, then have freedom and then come together and then using different tools in order to create a safe culture. And that just really appealed to me because I was like, if I'm going to do something like this, I need to kind of know what I'm doing and I don't know what I'm doing. So it felt really safe uh, for me to, to try that. And then I went to, um, I went to Charlotte in North Carolina and I took my first agile learning facilitation training and was just blown away. I was blown away by the people, the authenticity. I felt that for the first time in my life, I had found my tribe. I felt at home. Yay. Yeah, my my story was um, a little bit different in the sense that, well, in New York, you you have to like get on a waiting list when your kid is like two years old to like put them in pre-K. It's crazy and it's super competitive and everyone's like, where are you going to send your kid and what are you going to do? And already, like for me, I had started questioning a lot of things when I was pregnant with Sai. You know, you start to question like, how do you want to give birth? And then, you know, all the things that that follow that and when he was around two I started just visiting a lot of places like I, I visited the Montessori and I visited the Waldorf and the local public school which I ran out like crying and I was like oh hell no I'm not putting him there and you know I so I started getting really familiar with the landscape of education and, and trying to really understand what the options were knowing deep down inside and I think instinctively that my son is just like a very free spirit and now I know he's also neurodiverse so it's like I knew I needed something really different and special for him and so as I was like exploring the landscape of New York education, I kept seeing this group of kids in our local park and they were mixed age and it was like during school hours and they were climbing trees and they were digging in the dirt and I just kept following them and I was like, who it like who are they they should be in school right now like who? and it turned out to be a small homeschool cooperative that then later turned into an ALC that then was the ALC that in the future I would direct and then open up my own kind of branch to. And so it was like a beautiful love story of ALC world. Yeah. And so that was really my first introduction, but it was really the age mixing that was like the first thing that pulled me and seeing the kids being so free and seeing them out in, in nature and out in, in the, their real world exploring and not having like people hanging over them, telling them like what they needed to do. So yeah, it was really the first, it was the age mixing that really like pulled, my, pulled me in. But then once I started seeing how kids were being treated by the adults in the space, you know, cause I ended up volunteering there and um, I was just like, whoa, it rocked my world because it was really like, everyone was, everyone was equals. We were all there to learn together. There was no hierarchy. There was, it was really just about like exploration and fun and coming together and living. And, you know, since that also it's, there's been many, you know, iterations of, of that project. And, you know, I think it's even more freeing now too, and, and free for, for folks to really be their authentic selves. But just that idea that, um, there was nothing we were supposed to be. The kids weren't supposed to be doing something. It was really about just like that creative spark of what happens in the moment when we come together. I was like, I'm hooked. And that was it. I just went down the, the, the SDE de-schooling rabbit hole after that. And That's there's no so cool. I love it. So um, because we have been talking about Wardorf and sort of like the curriculum side of things, and then I'm hearing from... Um, you that there was an element of the soft structure made it feel like it was sort of easy to move into that and that kind of helps a little bit um 
how I'm curious a little bit about if you look at sort of a two or three month term and have any sense of where you're going um, or if it is totally free and that intersection between sort of total wide open freedom and the kids feeling sort of held in a sort of group context. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, here at Explora, we spend a lot of energy and time supporting the creation of a safe environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what, what I mean by that is like emotional safety. Of course, you know, not having like crazy dangerous things that are going to fall on top of kids, that safety always. But, you know, just so that, so that kids, especially neurodivergent kids, um, and all of us can come into a space and be heard and be understood and have supported and supported and respected. Keep going. <laughs> Just I would say like to be able to be our authentic selves, regardless of age and and be held. And, and what that looks like to us is that there's there's a lot of time and energy placed on um, checking in with let's say, right? When there's conflict in the space, really um, diving into that conflict with curiosity. And of course there are tools for conflict resolution, but really supporting kids to understand themselves so that they can, under they can communicate with others clearly and then they can also understand others. And so that is what is most important for us. We spend a lot of time around emotional intelligence and building emotional intelligence. And that can only be done through dialogue and the structure that we use supports having spaciousness in the day to get together and to connect in those ways. And so that's where the ALC tool also does come in, in play with you know setting the day and we we have a um, something called change up where we come together and it's an opportunity for us to share awarenesses and observations and begin to identify needs and feelings so that we can all come together and try to find solutions that hold like what you were saying that like hold one another um because it could become a shit show really really fast yeah. and so it's not like we all just come in and every day we just do whatever we want it's like no what's first and foremost um, is that we all feel safe here and that we all feel emotionally safe here and that it's a place where we begin to develop trust with one another and we begin to develop relationship with one another and of course wonderful things happen in that process when we do feel safe and when we do feel heard and so it's like the structure is there but the importance is is placed again on like having moments to connect with one another we spend a lot of time with staff like every single week, just checking in and saying, okay, so this so-and-so is showing up like this, they're, you know, having a rough week or, you know, this happened with, with this person and that person. What do you think is going on? What are some patterns? I mean, this is every day, every day yeah. there's a check-in in the morning and there's a checkout in the, in the afternoon. I don't work any longer with the kids because I am done. <laughs> <laughs> but I do support staff and the team and and parents too. and parents yeah because that's the other thing it's like you know what what we feel like from from being involved in various projects that doesn't work is like when we're so focused on a particular outcome of like what kids need to achieve or how even the space or the community should look like and we're focused on what we're doing and not so much on who we are and how we're being with one another and so um, a lot of projects go go to hell because of that, because it's like they focus so much on how, what the space looks like or what the structure is and what the calendar is and what the next few months are. But then the people that are actually there together have no way to resolve conflict and to talk about what's going on for them um, or kids, you know, maybe are coming into the space and they have like all of this support and freedom, but maybe at home they're not having that and so then the work then becomes like how do we support 
families to actually align with these values? And how do we support parents that maybe want this theoretically, but don't know how to put it into practice when they get home? And so maybe they start defaulting to like more oppressive ways of, you know, punishment using rewards and punishment and, you know, getting more controlling and authoritarian because they just don't know how. And so it's like, it's a lifestyle. It's not just like a drop-off program and when it is treated as such, it goes down the drain really quickly. And then also the kids kind of spiral out of control as well, because there's no support system. There's there's no um, contention. Really. Yeah, I mean, what I have seen in many projects, because I've coached so many, is that there is like a misunderstanding between freedom and free for all. Mm -hmm. So when adults that create a learning community uh, don't understand that freedom comes with a lot of responsibility, mm -hmm. but they just think that you can let everyone be completely free without any regard to as if we're harming one another or not, mm -hmm. that's where it doesn't work. And I would say that that's more common than, than not. Yeah. And so it's, I think a lot of people think that unschooling, environments or groups or schools or communities it's like kids get they run around like lord of the flies they get to do whatever the hell they want and it's like no if if your freedom is harming me as a human or it's like yeah it's not beneficial to to the group um then it's not working then it, it, it's it's not then it's free for all and then it could be quite dangerous too yeah. and i think that parallels parenting as well. Like if we're just totally hands off and it's like our kids are just doing whatever the heck they want and our needs as, as parents or adults in the space don't matter or our time, our creativity, whatever it is that who we are doesn't matter, then that's another form of authoritarian, you know, like an authoritarian oh, yeah relationship it's just the roles are flipped so yeah. we have to look at that too yeah and I'd love to also dig down a little bit just more into the sort of I love that it's it's freedom not free for all and um, I'd love to just hear like what that looks like practically so if somebody is like yes I believe in unschooling together and then they get a big crowd of kids together and they want to do the self-directing learning environment and then um, the it kind of spirals and there is a lot of like sort of disrespect for want of a better word but you know ways of just speaking that are not um kind of edifying and um you know undermining other people's learning process like how do you go about doing that in a group without a hierarchy and authoritarianism maybe we could bring up food beliefs, <laughs> beliefs around food because i think that put it all on the table that that like when we have for instance families that uh, don't believe in eating animals uh, the kids come with a lot of ideas around food and they tend to unfortunately place a lot of judgment on their friends that do eat meat and that doesn't always feel good um, in the way they speak with it so how can we deal with it yeah that's a great example mm -hmm. um and basically what, what, what happens is we are in a space, we are all diverse people. We have diverse feelings, beliefs, values. We do have a common thread and there should be that common thread, which is what I think holds the space together and the people together, right? The values around how we think about learning, um, what, what we believe like is respect for one another, mm -hmm. uh, what we believe freedom is. Um, like there should be some common threads that like bring us all together, like the advocacy for children's rights, um, you know, that like our, our desire to want to dismantle, you know, adult supremacy, like all of these things that are the foundation, but in the space, like what Becca was just saying, things come up all the time where, where we do have different values around it. And so I think at the very beginning, before like coming together, we need to have some ground rules of sorts, like some ground agreements. It's like, I take care of myself. I take care of those around me. I take care of my space. Like if you really like, it comes down to the basics. And 
really have commitment from everybody that even if we disagree on things, even if you eat meat and I don't, that because we are committing to being in this environment together, we're committing to having a dialogue about it, a respectful dialogue where we're not gonna shame and blame one another, where curiosity is what is the driving force of us coming together and creating those agreements. So it's like, maybe I don't agree with you and I have some really strong beliefs around it, but I wanna know why you feel the way that you do and why this is important to you. And really from a really young, young age, from the beginning, like supporting our kids to understand what diversity is and understand what tolerance is and understand that I don't necessarily have to agree with you, but unless you're like sticking a knife, you know, in my, in, in me, like I can choose to maybe step away when you're eating those foods, right? And maybe ask some really good questions to, to understand why you believe what you believe, or if it's something that's really, really bothering me, bring it up to change up, bring it up to our community meetings where it's like, I am having this really serious problem. Like every time Becca eats, I'm just, it's really bothering me. And let's talk about it. And I want to show you this documentary on veganism and, you know, whatever it is, so that those opportunities of, of what may seem like disconnect or conflict can become opportunities for learning and for growth and for connection. Where we can like bear, like get down to like, we're just humans living on this earth. And it's beautiful when we think different things. Let's just stick to the core agreements of not hurting one another or the space and we're good. <laughs> I love that. I love that really practical example. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, it's interesting to note that all of us here are neurodivergent families. And um, I, I have a, an estimate that's completely plucked out of the air, but something like the inversion of a usual school setting where they say 20% of children might be neurodivergent. I think it's the exact inversion in unschooling and it's more like 80% neurodivergence. Um, and so I'm curious about how that plays out in group settings, you know, because as you're talking, I'm like, that's great for kids that can sit there and have really long conversations. Right. But actually neurodivergence for a lot of kids manifests as a total, um, unwillingness or lack of capacity to have these long drawn out conversations. So I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit about that. And also other ways that you're honoring neurodivergence in your space, like what makes it specifically inclusive? I, I would like to just say that, for instance, I think that these spaces aren't always for everyone. Um, like my son, for instance, I mean, he, he went the first years when he was like 11, 12, and then he stopped going because it was still an after school. And there were too many kids from the ordinary. They're like the conventional school system. And he just couldn't cope with their ways of doing things. It was a bully mentality. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that now that he's 16 going on 17, he is a person that doesn't really connect with peers uh so like ha being around kids has never really been his thing he he, he functions better with adults mm -hmm. um so for him like it hasn't been a good option and i think that it's important just to say that 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 not all kids feel good hanging around peers and and i'll say sai is one of those kids that like never wants to be in a meeting <laughs> he will be bouncing around, jumping off the walls, like rolling around. And so I, I in full disclose, like full honesty here, like I did the, you have to be in the meeting and these are the agreements and this is what we have to do before I realized that he was neurodivergent. And I was like, oh, he doesn't need to change. I need to change. We need to change. And, and the, the reason for that was because he did, at the time he did wanna be in this space. So I felt like it was my responsibility to adapt to his needs at that time. But there are kids that don't wanna be in the space and they make it really, really clear they don't wanna be in the space and they don't give a shit about the, any of the rules or, or agreements or anything. And it's like, there also needs to be a level of readiness from, from kids. Readiness, willingness. I would say it's those two. And it's yeah. a consent thing. Like, so for those kids, they're unwilling, they don't want to be in the space, it doesn't work for them. Would you just say, oh. hey, family, 
it's not the right space. It doesn't work. It doesn't work if the kids don't want it because yeah. it, then it, it does become top down. And then it is about consent. Everything is about consent. Yeah. You know, it's like that if we're, if we're advocating for their right to choose, then if they're choosing to not be in the space, we have to listen to it. And every single time that the parents have been the ones that are like, no, I really want this for my kid. And the kid comes and it's like, the kid turns out to bully others or like destroys a space. They're just showing or, in every single way they can. I don't want to be here. Yeah. And it could be for various reasons. Yes, like it doesn't so have to many be, It's not necessarily anything to do with the center. Uh, I think many times it just has to do with the fact that they don't want to be there. Yeah. They have another agenda. Yeah. And uh, there was something else I was thinking about too, where I'm like, I think that what sometimes happens uh, even in agile learning centers is that some, I mean, we're supposed to be agile. We're supposed to adapt to the kids' needs, mm -hmm. but sometimes we can get really stuck in this idea of like, but we have to use the agile tools mm -hmm. without realizing that we're forcing kids to adapt to a tool that doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. And so like there, I see that sometimes we, we need to, we need to look at that, but I think that we've been doing that a lot at our center. Yeah. Least. And I think you brought up a really great question, Lucy. So like, how do you have the conversations with kids that might not want to show up to the meetings? And I think that, that this is, this is also where parent involvement is so important and where it's not just like, this is a place where I'm going to drop off my kid by like, there's so many parents that do want to just outsource like their parenting or their like unschooling support to a center or to other people. But it's like, th that's when the relationship comes into play and is super important because then you don't need to have a sit down meeting about the thing. You could talk to the parents about it and then the parents maybe at home can like find an opportune moment, you know, when you're like digging into something together or maybe that can happen in, in the space with other other caring humans, but it doesn't have to look the cert, like a, a one way for every single person, but it does require everyone to be on board. It requires everyone, like what's hard to like is when there's one parent that is like, yeah. And the other parent is just like, I'm not having it. I don't believe in this. Like there's no academics. <laughs> yeah. And when it, that, that is hard, that is really, really hard. And the kid is just super confused, right? Because maybe they love it in the space. They feel seen, they feel heard, but then maybe one parent is like, you know, oh, you're going there again, or this is a waste not of time. Anything. Yeah. You're not learning anything. And you just see how confused the kids are. And so yeah. that also requires a lot of work from, from families mm -hmm. to, to step up and, and, and start to challenge a lot of those like relational issues that they're having um, to try to get on the same page to advocate for, for their kids together. And if, if that's not happening, then it's, ooh, it's hard. It's, it's not impossible, but it's very hard. Yeah. yeah. That's so useful. Thank you so much. I feel like we should probably wrap it up yeah. a little but I also feel I was expecting to come on this call and just hear from you. And instead I got totally involved and just led you down a million <laughs> areas. But um, I imagine you do have some specific things to share about um, for people who might be considering, you know, an unschooling group. And I just want to give you the opportunity to talk, you know, if you've got any tips, for people or things you you would invite people to reflect on yeah i mean we right now are in a really interesting as you call it season of our <laughs> our project um and i think something that that folks you know either part of unschooling groups or communities or wanting to start them something that's really important to think about is like de-schooling does not just happen with our kids like it happens with each other it happens with ourselves it happens with the projects that we're leading and we're involved in and so explora is we're reinventing it right now completely completely reinventing it we're de-schooling our unschooling project yeah so we're changing like the amount of times that we meet we're you know doing looking at it really differently because if if things don't evolve then maybe it's not working, <laughs> you know, if it's working for everybody, great, but it's like, we are evolving all the time. And so I think 
like a tip of sorts is like, we have to be flexible and we have to also like realize when things aren't working and when things need to, need to evolve and need to be changed and kind of go with that flow. And, you know, one of our, one of our unschoolers here has a saying that I will never forget. And he was like, you know, let the water take you where it wants you to go. And it's, if you don't have that mentality in unschooling and in, you know, communities, then it's going to turn into something super rigid at some point. Yeah. And I think that every place is unique. Every place has a different kind of setting. Uh, this is, for instance, a very transient place. It's a place that is very small. Not a lot of people come here to live here because the internet is crap, as you have noticed. And also because there are no jobs, you know, you already have to have that part sorted out. So like our setting looks very different from if you're living in a big city, for instance. So I think that that is also really important to take into consideration and see if like, for instance, if, if I would do this again from the beginning, I wouldn't start up a center. I would start looking for other people who would want to maybe de-school together mm -hmm. and just starting like a de-schooling group and then maybe get together with our kids or not because mine wouldn't have wanted to anyway. <laughs> but I would have been looking for it for me and then uh, see where it wanted to go from there and it's exactly this thing like let the water take you where it wants you to go like maybe we're forcing something sometimes because we have a very specific idea of what it should look like which i think happens also when you offer a space where kids can come every day um it's it, it can be hard for parents to understand that this isn't really a school Mm -hmm. And no, you're not just paying for a service and dropping them off. Mm -hmm. We need you to be more involved. And even though it doesn't mean that the parents need to let go of their work to be working at the center, at least doing the de-schooling. Yeah. Um, so do you so think yeah. there's something to be said for just starting as a small group of families, hanging out, doing the work together, and then seeing where that kind of evolves? Um, yeah. That's how our own learning group on our farm began, you know, yeah. seven years ago, it was just a like nature play group. And then yeah. it evolved into something else that was slightly more like, please do show up because it was really random. It was like anybody, 100 people come. And then we'd never see them again. And then like after a couple of years, we're like, that doesn't feel very sustainable. <laughs> and also it's not, it feels like community, but it's actually not community because your kids aren't getting the chance to work things out with each other. So then we, we shrunk and it became a bit more of a commitment, still just like week, once a week, hanging out in nature together. But you kind of said you intend to be there for the term or something. And then after a couple of years, it evolved into like a very beautiful little learning collective. Yeah. And so it felt very, it felt really like sort of sustained growth. And it also felt very experimental at every stage. We were just like, let's experiment, you know? So we never felt yeah, like we yeah. had this thing and we were aiming for it and da and it's gonna look like this, but it was, we tried to have, and I think that's one of the very beautiful things about the unschooling mindset and the de-schooled mindset, isn't it? Is that you sort of are a scientist, just experimenting. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We're experimenting all the time. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. It's, it's so much about the process, not the outcome. Like there is no outcome. Yeah. The, out, the, the process is what we're looking for. And so I think also I will say like, accountability is very important though in that process because if you're that one person that is like holding it all together you are going to burn out mm -hmm. and you're not going to be there for your kids you're not going to be there for yourself for your community so it's like I will say like before even entering into an unschooling community ask yourself what you are willing and able to give mm -hmm. because it's not just about stepping in and receiving and then leaving it's about like we're we're taking care of one another and that's what community is yeah and what what are you bringing with you like what are you contributing with yeah yeah so it's like if we're asking the kids to do that with the you know or we're supporting the kids to do that we have to do that ourselves as well and we have to be accountable as the adults in the space so it's 
Yeah. I love that. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Any last comments? I mean, it's been so rich. I don't need anything from you. (laughs) I I just wanted to make sure you're, you know, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Lucy, like you have been such an inspiration too in the work that we do. And I think um, seeing like, and being reminded of the joy, you know, that like we're, we're chasing joy. We're seeking joy in this process, you know? And, and that I think sometimes it's so easy to get like really bogged down by all of the logistics. And like you said, then it becomes like this thing that we're trying to do. And it's like, it's not fun anymore. And so we are like reinventing this whole thing because we want to have more fun. We want to, you know, yeah. And I think, I think like remembering that we're foremost we are mothers to unschoolers Mm -hmm. and our biggest commitment is to them Mm -hmm. and when you decide to create a center or run a community in the way that we have done in the past we're suddenly taking on responsibility for other people's kids in a way that maybe we didn't intend not like that not like oh they're outsourcing all their responsibilities to us <laughs> and so I think that there's so much de-schooling uh, in this process that is so valuable where I didn't think about those things before starting Explora I hadn't thought of any of that uh, I didn't think that I could do it differently it was different already doing a kindergarten and after school so I thought I was like yay and it was probably good but still I think that um, we come with so many um predetermined thoughts and we need to really look at them because suddenly we are in this space where it's like oh no I can't move any longer it's yeah. it's too it's too tight and that is where we can actually step out of it and just be like nope this is not working we have the right to change this again so the freedom to quit the freedom to change things the freedom to be agile I think we need to really celebrate that and the constant work that it takes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the huge element as well, like, and why it becomes rigid, um, I think that we haven't mentioned is that we live in an imperialist capitalist society where school is an essential function um, that we're not participating in, but yet we're still kind of living in the society and so we do sort of need jobs and and I'm a huge fan of parents getting jobs that are fulfilling and obviously a huge fan of parents getting jobs that mean they can financially thrive (laughs) like these essential things and so you you are kind of doing this dance of like wanting to create spaces for your kids but also create some freedom for yourself to thrive within a system that's totally reliant on school so that I think can can mean you get like a little bit tightly focused and a little bit like rigid on this thing and so it is like this um kind of almost uh yeah like an art really like like so much of unschooling of of a, an art around kind of how we're holding this how we're experimenting we we have this intention but it's not quite a goal <laughs> you know <laughs> and we want to thrive under capital we're allowed to thrive under capitalism and so we can set things up so we can do that without getting sort of inane about it or something um and I, I think that is one of the tricky things about unschooling is its artfulness it's not a science it's not um, a curriculum and you know the main thing there for me the biggest takeaway is the de-schooling that parents are doing because every moment you're spending in a de-schooling space you're tapping into your inner wisdom and that inner wisdom is your guide for the art and that inner wisdom is your guide for the space that you're setting up and your guide for navigating all your relationships in that space, you know? Yeah. So um, it's all it's all yeah. integrated and woven together. But the, I think the main thing is like that, that checking in that self-wisdom and yeah. yeah. In that Absolutely. work, in that yeah. personal work, there's yeah. no separation, you know, it's like, it's, it's, you have to constantly be working on yourself and caring for yourself so that you can show up to do the work. Yeah. And if you're showing up, 
amazing things can happen. You know, I always love to just keep so much room for that. Like if you're actually showing up to like that, that work and that wisdom, honestly, actual miracles can happen in your groups and spaces and relationships and unschooling homes. You know, like there's so much potential in the fields that we can be tapping into if we're doing that sort of um, in a piece. If we let go of what we think it needs to look like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm a bit of a Joe Dispenza fan and he has this saying that the more time you spend in the unknown, the more potential you open up. And I, I'm spending a lot of time in the unknown at the moment with groups <laughs> and things. And I'm just holding on to that. And like, and I'm sitting in meetings and just holding on to that feeling that this is scary, it's unknown. But as I sit here and as we all sit here in this kind of messy, complicated space, we are open at, opening up more potential for our group. I had this really wild moment the other day when I was like meditating on all of, you know, like just because de-schooling is just one big meditation. <laughs> it's like <a> constant <laughs> meditation. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is what enlightenment is. <laughs> this is what like this de-schooling, like the unfolding, the unraveling, the unlearning and relearning and being in it while that like chaos is happening and it's beautiful and scary and this and that, but it's like constantly evolving. Like, wow, is that, is that what Siddhartha experienced? Was he a de-schooler? <laughs> like, I call it the sacred path of unschooling because it is a spiritual quest, I think. And I think it's contributing a huge amount to this current evolution. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> that's freedom and that's freedom. Yeah. Oh, it's been so beautiful to talk with you. Thank you so much. What an amazing way for me to begin my day. And an auspicious day. It's um, winter solstice here. So we sort of are moving into the next season and everything that's going to unfold in, in that season. And um, yeah, I just bless you guys and this transition oh for God. you. And Thank you. yeah, so so work. Thank you so much, Lucy. Take Honored care. in the space with you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.